Um, by the way, this is an awesome church. Like this is like, who gets to go to church like this? Have you, like, look at that. Like, just, you got, like, gardens, and I mean, this is amazing. Like, gosh, I wish I lived here. Um, you guys are very blessed by the Lord. This is like a little glimpse of heaven, I think, you know. Um, it is a real privilege to be here. We love Pastor Greg and Chris so much. Um, I don't know, we've not known them super long, but the little bit that we've gotten to know them, um, I've just been so impressed, and I love their hearts, and so thankful for what God's doing here in this church. Um, the staff here, you've got incredible staff and leaders here. Uh, and we are so excited for what God's doing here. I, the mainland, as they would say, feels your faith. Your faith is reverberating beyond this island. You know, even though there's a couple of hours between us and the mainland, um, what God's doing here is rippling. It's, it's having an effect. And sometimes when you live somewhere, uh, especially on an island, you can maybe think, oh, I want to, you know, we just, we just over here by ourselves. No, faith is transcendent. Faith moves. Faith moves mountains, right? Um, and your faith is moving the name of Jesus and the kingdom forward. You guys help Maui, but you guys are helping beyond that, you know. And more than your financial contribution, your faith contribution and the leaders you raise up and what you bring to the body of Christ is so valuable. So, well, guys, I want to just quickly show you a photo of my family. This is my wife and, and, and the rest of the gang. Zeke is somewhere having fun. I think he's trying to fish in one of the ponds. Um, <laughs> He's like third service daddy. I can listen to you two times, but the third time I'm going fishing. Um, and that's my wife, Katie. We've been married for 15 years. Um, that's my, uh, my oldest son, Omalimo, is 16. We adopted him when he was 15 months old. Uh, some people, you know, when they're trying to, they don't understand we adopted him. We're like, well, we just kind of left him out for a good tan. So he's a little couple, couple shades more tan than, than us. Um, and so then we have Isaiah, and then we have Ezekiel that's here with me. He turned 12 this week. He came on a daddy, father, son trip with me. And then Corin and Audley. Um, all my kids love Jesus. They all have given their life to the Lord. They, they love Him. They've been baptized. They, well, actually, Audley has not yet been baptized. She's going to be baptized very soon. But they've all put their faith and trust in Jesus. And they tell their friends about Jesus. Uh, and they force me to have Bible studies that's expensive because they want donuts and chocolate milk at these Bible studies. And I'm like, guys, I can't buy chocolate milk and donuts for the whole neighborhood. Um, but Saturday mornings at 8.30, we have family. My kids' uh, teammates come to our house, and they keep inviting people. Daddy, they, need, they, they don't know Jesus. Daddy, they don't know Jesus. And they just bring people to my house all the time. So our whole family is on mission, and I think that's the best way to live and build family is to be family on mission. All right, so in the next three hours, I want to talk to you guys. I'm just joking. Um, I want to talk to you guys in the, in, the, in the next few minutes about God's power and man's purpose. God's power and man's purpose. As Pastor Greg said, I work in college ministry. Never in my wildest dream did I ever imagine being in college ministry. Never in my wildest dreams did I even ima ever imagine or picture being in ministry and never in my wildest dream that I imagined I would ever stand in Hawaii, in Honolulu, talking about Jesus. I come from a small little Dutch or Afrikaans town in South Africa. And I was a big deal there. <laughs> okay. It didn't take much to be a big deal there, but I was a big deal there. Okay. <laughs> I was a very gifted rugby player. I came from a very well-respected family. My mom and dad owned, owned a couple of businesses. They were very, you know, good at what they did. My dad was an elder in our church. He preached. Um, you know, my dad was really respected in our community. I've got two brothers. We all have played pro. When I was in high school, um, I dated Miss Teen South Africa. Uh, so I had the prettiest girlfriend, a teenager, a girlfriend in the, in the country. Um, and I was a good athlete. And I had a great family, and we had a lot of opulence. And so my life, uh, if, you, if you would have told me then what would God would do in my life and that God would completely interrupt my life, I would have laughed at you. In fact, I remember a pastor telling me when I was much younger, he would look at me and say, you're going to be a minister, you're going to work for God someday. And I said, leave me alone. I have a plan for my life. I have plans. I don't know. I don't care what God's plan is. I have a plan. And maybe you have plans for your life. And maybe you have planned your own life and you have dreams and aspirations and vision boards and you've written things down. And I think to some measure, all of us have some idea or plan for our own life. But the, the truth is, is that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. But you need God's power to actually enter that. 
Without God's power, you can never enter God's plan and purpose for your life. And see, that's the, 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 that's the, the real big challenge today is we are not bothered by the fact that God, ha- or, or we're, not, we're not maybe as moved by the fact that God has power because, you know, you have been able to live in a home and have enough food and electricity and running water. You've, you've had food security, financial security, and all those things. And that's kind of how I grew up. Like, I don't have the typical story of, oh, this dude was really struggling and God rescued him. And like, no, my life was great. And in my life, I didn't actually see a lot of room for God. Why did I need him? My mom and dad loved him. Why do I need God? I... I have a good life. I'm popular. I'm good at what I do. I've got, got a pretty cute girlfriend, you know. That's bragging rights right there, you know. Feel pretty proud of yourself when you walk into a school of 800 people and you happen to date one of the 800 that's the prettiest girl in the country. You feel good about yourself and you're in the newspaper every weekend and your photo is up there and, and you, you, feel, you start feeling, man, I'm good. I don't need God. That's for some weaklings. I'll go to church. I'll, I'll bless the church with my presence sometimes. <laughs> you know, I'll kind of walk in there, act like I'm a big deal, and, you know, and kind of, you know, I'm, I've got something to give to the church maybe. You know, I showed up at church. Maybe that helps them. I didn't understand that I had a purpose, a God-given purpose, and I didn't understand that I needed God's power. And then at some point... My eyes was opened, and I realized, man, I'm lost. I really, I'm I'm chasing the wrong things, and I needed power, but not power that I had. I needed God's power, because I had a lot of worldly power. I had a lot of it. I had, I mean, you talk about power in in worldly terms. If you're a good athlete, you you have some power. You walk into a room, head's turn. Um, you, you, You date Miss South Africa, people know when you walk into the room. People know when you walk into the restaurants. People know when you drive in somewhere. Your name is on the side of your car. People are just paying to touch your shirt and get your autograph. Like you feel like somebody. That's power in this world. But it's worldly power that has no capacity to change hearts. It's not ultimate power. It's the type of power that people try to earn and work for and get more of in this life. And see what I didn't realize at that time. I was trapped and bound to the power of man, and I was lacking the power of God, true power. You know, and I was 19 years old when most of my dreams started becoming a reality. I became a professional rugby player straight out of high school. And so now all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the, not just in my town, I'm a, a big deal, I'm becoming a big deal in my country. And all of a sudden, I have this really, really rude awakening And I realized, man, there is some deep, deep, deep sin inside of me. And I want to take you to the scriptures to understand more of what I'm talking about. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And then Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. is going to help us understand. I want to unpack this a little bit. And and, and help us see our need for God's power to walk in in, in our purpose. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. This is what the apostle Paul said to the church in Rome. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. This is what Paul said. Remember who Paul was. Paul was a rather successful individual. Paul was a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a leader of leaders. Some people think that he had the equivalent of two PhDs. Before he was 30 years old, he was a brilliant man. He was a zealot. No one could match him in his passion for the name of God. He was a religious zealot. He was an eloquent speaker. He was a man that had a lot of economic and political and religious power. He was really revered in his generation. 
But this Paul on his way to persecute the church, to go and kill Christians, imprison Christians. In fact, some believe that he was there when the first martyr, Stephen, was martyred and killed. And he was the one that allowed that to happen. He was anti-Jesus. He was anti because Paul trusted in himself. Paul trusted in what he did for God. And on his way to Damascus, this man of great power, of great notoriety, of opulence, of success, meets Jesus. And the power of the gospel transforms his heart. And it changes everything. When you meet the true Jesus, not some watered-down American, European, Western version of Jesus, the Jesus, the God of the Bible, he who Paul talks about, that this, the, the, he's not ashamed of, the gospel that changes life because it's the power of God. When you meet that Jesus, your life can never look the same again. You cannot be the same again. It is impossible for your life to be the same. When I met my wife, Katie Kruger, 15, 16 years ago on October 28, 2007, and seven days later proposed to her, November 5th, that's, I'm, not this, I'm not prescribing that. That's not prescriptive. I'm just describing what happened, okay? Don't want to create problems here in Honolulu. Boys, don't do that unless you really have a word from the Lord and your pastors and leaders have helped you figure this out. There was a lot more involved that I can't unpack right now. When I met her and I became one with her and stepped into a covenant with her, my entire life changed. One, I started speaking a new language. English is not my first language. That's why my grammar is a little shaky. I had to learn how to speak her language. Currently, I live in Nashville, Tennessee. That was never on the books or on the cards. My whole life shifted. I adopted a black child. I, that was never in my plan for my life. We built an orphanage. That was never in my plan for my life. We, so much changed just because this beautiful woman that loves Jesus came into my life. And she is a human being. And my whole life changed because of a relationship, a covenant with her. Imagine the God of the universe steps into your life. How much more will your life not change when he who created all things and everything is now in covenant with you? Your life cannot look the same. I appeal to you, my friends and my, my, my dear friends, my brothers and sisters. You cannot tell me, yeah, 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 I made Jesus and I'm still the same. I, I have not met a person like that. Now, I do know people that know about him that look the same. I know people that goes to church that looks the same, but I do not know anyone that has stepped into an eternal covenant, that has experienced the power of the gospel that is still the same. Because anyone that meets Jesus meets the power that comes from him, that emanates from him. It is eternal life. Paul said, I will not withhold this back because the moment you meet Jesus, everything is different from that day forward. I remember when I became a Christian, like I was a Christian, but then I became a Christian, which means I started following Jesus. I was now bound to Him for the rest of my life. The moment that happened, it's as if trees became more beautiful. It's as if God's creation took on a new form. It's as if the people of God, the image bearers, had more value. It's as if all of a sudden I understood things and I've been living for 19 years, but I've not been living. I've been dead and trapped in my sin. The power of God made me realize that I was dead and trapped until I met Jesus and the power that's in the gospel. That's why we preach this gospel all over the world. That's why we go to the college campus where some people think young people don't care about Jesus. They don't care about culture's version, version watered down Jesus. They, when they meet the real Jesus, they want to share him with all their friends. There's no one like him. Come on, I like that. Yee-hoo. Come on. 
Oh my goodness. And so here's what the gospel does. The gospel takes that which is dead and makes it come alive. In Ephesians chapter 2, our next passage, verse 1, this is what the apostle Paul said to the church in Ephesus. This is what he said to the believers in Ephesus. He said in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, he says, you were dead. You were, past tense, dead. You once walked in the power and the sins you once walked in, following the course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. Amongst whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by children, by nature, children of wrath. Like the rest of mankind. Oh my gosh, was I bound to my fleshly desires? Was I bound to what my culture's expectations? Was I bound to what people thought of me? Was I bound of how, how I looked and appeared? I was so bound. I was a slave to sin and man. I was a slave to everything but God. I wanted people to be impressed by me. I wanted people to like me. I wanted people to know that I'm dating the most beautiful teenager in the world. I wanted, they were so, I was so bound to culture's expectations. I wanted to live in a certain neighborhood so people do not look down on me. I wanted people to have respect for me. I wanted my name on the side of my car, which most professional athletes in Africa have that, because I wanted to drive in and I wanted people's heads to turn and think, that dude, he is successful. He's somebody. I was so bound to my own flesh fleshly desires and then I started ruining myself because I could not control my fleshly desires I was controlled by them wow. I was dead in my sin I knew what's right but I love what's wrong I knew what sin and I couldn't stop sinning I knew it was damaging I saw the damage I couldn't stop my life was like a runaway train and Paul said you were once dead trapped pulled and swayed by your sin you had no power and then he says, but God, verse 4, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. And then he said, by grace you've been saved. And, and then he raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, this is what Paul said. For by grace you have been saved through faith. He said, and this is not your own work, your own doing. It is the gift of God. So that it's not a result of works so that no man may be arrogant or boast and say, I saved myself by being religious, by reading my Bible, by going to church. No, you received God's grace by faith. And that, therefore, you have been saved. For we are His workmanship. Say workmanship. We are His ambassadors. We are His image bearers. We are His laborers. We are His kingdom ambassadors in the earth we are his representative and we've been created now in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them so the power of God first saves us from being children of wrath like the rest of mankind and then it propels us into his divine purpose for our lives this is how it works Here's what the younger generation does. Oh, man, I, I, I want to utilize spirituality for my own benefit. You know, I, I recognize I have a spiritual need, so I'm going to become spiritual. I'm going to be a little bit, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to eat sushi on Sundays, you know, nothing else. I'm going to sit, sit certain ways. I'm going to do some yoga. I'm going I'm to try some things out. I'm going to try and be a little spiritual. I'm going to try to be contemplative, reflective. I'm going to try and journal a little bit. I'm going to burn some sage. I'm going to do some stuff. I'm, 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 I'm going to try to be spiritual a little bit. I need spirituality. That's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to create my own little sp plan for salvation. I'm going to save myself a little bit. Not realizing that you're eternally bound to your condition, which is sin. That's an eternal condition. And if you're not freed by Jesus and made alive by Jesus Christ, you'll be bound to sin for all eternity. And the biggest deception is that you think you don't need Jesus. 
that Jesus is some one of the options in the grocery aisle of religion. Oh yeah, I feel like I'm going to get a little Jesus today, but you know tomorrow I'll get a little Buddha. You know, no, the next day I'm going to get a little Baha'i. I like Baha'i. Oh, you know, maybe I, maybe I should become a Messianic Jew. Maybe, maybe that's the most pure way to express. You know, maybe I should become a kind of a Jew, even though you know, you're not, you're Gentile, so remember that. You can never become a Jew. And we try and come up with these ideas and ways. Maybe if I just go to church two times a month, I would get right with God. Maybe if I learn how to pray better. Maybe if there's a certain type of prayer, if I pray that prayer, I would get myself right with God. And I will see this darkness in me fade, and I'll see light come. The proposal that God makes in these scriptures is not that we solve our problem. It's that God alone can solve our problem. Our sin issue is bigger for, than any man can ever solve. That's why God became a man in Jesus Christ. And that's why he hung on this cross. That's why he got on this cross. It's our sin and inability to save ourselves that demanded that God sent a sacrifice, a sacrificial lamb, an innocent lamb, the lamb of God to pay for the sins of the world so that sinners may have a new life, so that we can become alive. And here's the thing. We don't actually believe in the power of the gospel, and here's why. My, one of my old teammates, I just signed a new deal with a team. He was a very, he's a very popular and, and, and strong, famous rugby player. If you, if you liked rugby, you would know him, but none of you guys do because you didn't even know that America won a bronze. Um, <laughs> which is, you know, that's between you and the Lord, you know, <laughs> um, and your other countrymen. Um, but I remember going onto a campus one day to share my testimony, and he, I had just signed with the team. He, didn't, he knew I was coming because they read about it, and they were like, oh, Ernie is coming to this team. And, but it, they didn't know I'm a Christian. So I show up and he says, what are you doing on campus? I said, well, I'm here to share my testimony. He said, bro, it's impossible to be a Christian on campus. Bro, alcohol is too cheap and the girls are pretty easy. Verbatim. I'm, that's a direct quote. And I looked at him and I said, Francois, you don't know my Jesus. Because I once was bound to the cheap alcohol prices on my campus. And to how available goals were for a professional athlete. And, and took advantage wrongfully of that. But until I met Jesus. And my whole perspective shifted and changed. I said, why don't you come with me tonight? And that night he gave his life to Christ. And the power of Jesus freed that man. And all of a sudden he has been building the kingdom of God from that day. He's got a godly wife. Godly children, they all love the Lord. They live in France. He's coaching and leading people to, to Christ. He's, he's now in, in, in leaving rugby as a player and coaching rugby. And God has built the kingdom through this man. He was 19 when he became a Christian. And the same day, within an hour of him telling me, this Jesus thing, Ernie, is not enough. It doesn't work because sin is too strong. There's no match for the power of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said, listen, I understand why, that we need power to be transformed. And the moment Paul encountered Jesus, he was radically transformed. The moment I encountered Jesus, I was radically transformed. The moment Francois encountered Jesus, he was radically transformed. And let me tell you, Jesus don't need you to help him save you. You can't help. Oh, let me help you, Jesus. No, no, no. You cannot help him. You need to be saved by him. And the moment you put complete confidence, complete faith in what Jesus did on the cross, in his grace, the work of God on the cross, that's when you are saved. You are saved from sin. You are saved out of sin. You are saved into the kingdom of God. And now you are being propelled and kept in the kingdom of God by his grace. And you become his workmanship, his laborers. All of us have dreams and plans for our lives. The question is, are we living God's dream for our lives? Are we living in this by faith alone and grace alone? Not that we only enter the kingdom, but live in the kingdom and fulfill kingdom work. God has called all of us to participate in building and advancing the name of Jesus. And the moment you meet him, you cannot withhold him. When I encountered Christ, the first thing I said, this is the first thing I said, if God can do this in me, this power is so great. It's like nothing I've ever felt in my life. The whole world must know. Those were the first sentences that came out of my mouth when I met Jesus. I realized that this was not just a message for me. That this was 
the power that every person I knew needed. And I started gossiping the gospel <laughs> to all my friends. Hey, did you know? Hey, did you know? And you know what happened? My friends saw the transformation in me. My brothers, see, this, all my friends, all of us came from really reputable and well-to-do families. And all of us, uh, we knew what was right, but we loved what was wrong. And the moment they saw the transformation in my life, they knew that God was real. They said, Ernie, it's crazy. What's happening to you? I said, I don't know. The only thing I can think of is Jesus. The power of the cross saves us out of sin. It delivers us from sin. And it doesn't just do that. It actually brings us into God's divine purpose and plan for our lives. I have never been faithful to any goal up until my wife. In fact, I was afraid to get married because I thought there's no way I can be faithful to one woman for the rest of my life. I've never been faithful. For 19 years, I, in South Africa, we started dating a little early. So eight, when I was eight, I had my first girlfriend. And my family thought it was great. Oh, this is so cute. We were writing each other letters and whatever. I never really talked in person, never went on a date, but she was my girlfriend, you know. Most of them knew they were my girlfriend at that point, you know. And I've always cheated. And, and the older I got, the more serious my, cheat, my cheating became. And then my friends that didn't know the Lord before we became Christians... A lot of them got divorced within a year of being married. So I was like, man, this is crazy. Like, I don't think relationships work. So I wanted to stay single out of fear until I met Jesus and he changed my life. In 15 years, I haven't even come close. In 15 years, I haven't watched pornography. In 15 years, I haven't cheated on my wife. I have no secrets. My wife, my son's got my phone right now. My wife's got all my, there is no secrets in my life. I don't have to live a secret life anymore because Jesus came and dealt with a sinner in me and changed my heart. I have nothing to hide anymore. That is the power that's in the cross. Not only did I see that in my life, I've seen that in hundreds and thousands of other young men and women's lives. People that was bound to sin, they couldn't help themselves. They were slaves of sin. They've been transformed by the power of the cross. That is the beauty and the power that's in the name of Jesus. The one name that's above every other name. The one name to which every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that he alone is God. He is the master, the king, the savior. There is no other salvation plan. If there were, I would be preaching it. I found no one that could, that could rid me of my sin. No amount of religion and, 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 tr and trying, no, no amount of money can buy your freedom. It's only through the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that we are freed. And the moment we experience God's power like that, we discover our God-given purpose and we start making disciples. I remember when I became a Christian, all of a sudden I had this desire to tell people about Him. And I would have these conversations and it would be normal conversations. It would be conversations over breakfast, over lunch, over dinner, in our homes, in our apartments, in a car, on the way to practice, in the gym. And my, my immediate uh, environment. And all of a sudden, I started seeing my friends make decisions to follow Christ. And then I started seeing their lives changed. And now they own companies. And now they, they perpetuate the kingdom of God through their businesses. They have many employees and families that works for them. And all of them love Jesus. They, they are building the kingdom of God. These are kingdom builders. These men fund the kingdom and build the kingdom. They have families that build the kingdom. The moment the power of God saves us, it frees us from our worldly desires and worldly ways and worldly uh, little kingdoms that we try and build. And we start building the one true kingdom, the only kingdom that really is everlasting. Thing. And you know what I'm so thankful for? Is that God uh, freed me from wanting to build my own kingdom. I, I'm telling you, if you don't build God's kingdom, right, if you're not busy with building God's kingdom right now, you're building your own. The church is not a place where people erect their own little kingdoms. They're all little, little beautiful kingdoms and say, hey, look at me. Oh, God's blessing me. Look at God's blessing. Look at God. That's not what God's blessing is for. God blesses us for His purpose. That we can build His kingdom. That His name can be built. That His name can be glorified. That people can be saved by that same power that Paul preached. That they would put their faith in that Jesus. You, my friends, are His workmanship. You have been created, born again, in, through Jesus Christ. And God has good works for you. When God asked me to become a missionary, 
and, and serve as a college minister, I said, God, there's no way. Like, I have other talents. I can make money. I can give money. God said, I don't want you to give money. I want you to give yourself. I said, yes, Lord. I told my family. My dad said, are you crazy? Are you nuts? Why would you ask people for money to go tell people about Jesus? You have money. Give other people money. I said, I said Daddy, God called me. He's called me to do this. This is my job. This is, I want to honor him. I don't want to build my own kingdom. The kingdom of Ernie. There's a greater kingdom. There's one true kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. Amen. Let's stand together and pray. Pastor Greg, you want to come join me for this? Grace Honolulu, you have an inheritance from Jesus. God is pulling you together as an ecclesia, as a governing structure to bring God's kingdom and governance to this, to this part of the island and to this island and from here to the ends of the earth. God has strategically placed you in different places in, in the marketplace or on the campus or in the high schools. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. God has a divine redemptive purpose for your life. And through your life, God wants to redeem this island and this lives. And from this island, the world will be touched. Because that's how our God thinks. Psalms 24 says, all the world belongs to the Lord. The fullness thereof. All the world and everyone that dwells therein. Everything is His. And when you fully become His, you participate and partake and become a co-laborer in His mission to redeem creation. There's no other way to live. If you're a doctor, that better be your focus. If you're a lawyer, that better be your focus. If you're an entrepreneur, that better be your focus. If you're a missionary, that better be your focus. If you're a parent, that better be your focus. We are raising children for the glory of God and the expansion of His kingdom. Our lives, everything about our lives in Christ is on purpose. We are His workmanship. Called by God for His work. We are co-laborers empowered by His Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the Spirit that He gives to us to empower us to become His witnesses to the ends of the earth. Amen. If you have not put your faith in Jesus exclusively, solely, completely, and you've kind of tried to help Jesus a little bit, and you recognize, I need to surrender my life to Jesus. I need to fully surrender and give over. I want you to put your hand up and I want to pray with you. Say, today I'm making that decision. I am, I'm surrendering completely and utterly and fully to Jesus. I'm putting my trust in Him. I want Him to break me out of this prison that I'm in, of sin and darkness. I don't want to pretend. I want to walk with Jesus. I want His power to come into my life. If that's you, put your hand up really high so I can see. All right. I will no longer live for myself. I will no longer play religious games. I'm going to walk with the living King, the true God. I'm going to covenant with Him. I'm going to be bound to Him. I'm going to be made alive together with Christ. I'll never be the same again. God's power is going to work in me and through me from this day forward. Let's pray this prayer together. I want you to pray this out loud. Say, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I surrender my whole life to You. I give You my life. I give You my future. I give You my talents. I give you my sin. I hold nothing back from you. Lord, you are my God. And I will serve you all the days of my life. My life will glorify you. You can pour me out in this earth as you please. You can send me anywhere you want to. There's no place off limits. There's nothing you cannot ask me. I am yours from this day forward. You are mine from this day forward. And I accept what you did for me 2,000 years ago. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God a praise. Help us. Help us because even though we, we believe what you just said, sometimes we don't really believe what you just said. We believe, how many of you ascend? I mean, we believe that the gospel is the power of God and there's nothing else that can save us. But sometimes we live as if we don't believe that the power, gospel is the power of God and nothing else can save us. Yeah. And I think that comes into play particularly when we try and share our faith with other people. Yeah. 
we think that somehow we got to do something to save somebody. Yeah. And it's the gospel that saves them. Yes. It's not us who save them. In fact, I just sense that some of us are maybe a little weary of sharing our faith with somebody because we haven't saved them yet. And you won't be able to save them yet. That's not your place. The gospel is the power of God. Yeah. Can, can you just tell us a little bit about how you've seen that in your life? I, I love what you were telling me about your interaction with your grandfather. Yeah. Yes, Pastor Greg. So about maybe five years ago, my father-in-law called me and he said, Ernie, you need to come to Nashville immediately. He said, my father is dying. And that I was just told by hospice that, that he doesn't have many more days. And I, I, I don't think that he's going to go to heaven. Can you please come spend three days with him? So I took my Bible. And for three days, I sat on his bedside. And I would lay my Bible on his bed next to his legs. And he was in final stages of dementia. He's being kept alive by machines. He can't do anything. He's, he's very dependent on other people. But every so often, you would have five hours of complete cognitive clarity. And he would be very present. Like he would, he would come out of dementia and he would just be Fred, the Fred that we know. And I would read the Gospels to him. I had five minutes, I'd read it, read it, and he would go back into that state of being somewhat delusional. And the third day of me reading the Gospels to him, he looks at me and he points his finger and says, Ernie, I've never thought that the Gospel was good news. It was never good news to me. I never thought that I needed Jesus. But now and he got emotional. He says, but now I see. I understand that only he can save me. Because see, by the end, towards the end of his life, he was raised Catholic and he would do the Hail Mary and he would pray profusely and he would just be so agonized. He was so afraid to face God. He's like, man, I've got to make up. I've got to make up for all my sin. And he kept trying to do all these things and he became so ultra religious, but he had not peace. And I said, Grandpa, when we know Jesus, we get His peace. We have peace in our soul. And in that moment, he prayed a prayer of faith and he put his faith in Jesus. And I said, Grandpa Fred, there's nothing that you can do for God. God doesn't need you to do anything for Him. He has the authority and the desire to save you. And right there at 85 years old, Grandpa Fred, at the end of his life, gave his life to Jesus. Didn't do one good thing for Jesus. And 10 days later, he went to go be with the Lord. That's the power of the gospel. And then I walk out of his room, and I'm literally about to go tell the family, Fred gave his life to Jesus. And as I'm walking out, this 85-year-old man, another 85-year-old man is leaning against the wall, sick. I don't even understand why he's in the hallway. And he's just waving at me, like really weak. And I go, I say, sir, do you need a doctor? He says, no, 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 I need to talk to you. And his name tag says Billy, his hospital tag. I say, Mr. Billy, what's going on? He said, I don't have many days to live. I'm about to face God. I've been running from Him my whole life. I'm not ready. And something told me I need to talk to you. I've got chicken skin. I said, Mr. Billy, do you know I'm a pastor? He says, no, but I knew something said I need to just... He literally flagged me down to this hospital in in hospice. So I said, I pull up a chair and the nurse is, you know, is annoyed with Mr. Billy. I said, hey, stop, hold on. God's doing something like this. This, this, this is an important moment. Billy, this is important for Billy. And within five minutes, Mr. Billy, that couldn't do one good thing for Jesus, gave his life to the Lord. Both of those men, and within 10 days, passed away and passed on to be with Jesus. That is the power of our gospel. They could do nothing for Jesus, but all they had is they could put their faith in what he did for them. And Jesus saved them. And I, those brothers, when they went into heaven, Woo! they were like, Fred, Billy, we made it, baby. We made it in. They were with Jesus. That's the beauty of our Savior. You and I are not in hospice. We have work to do. Yeah, yeah. And the Spirit of God doesn't just save us, but He actually is calling us to be laborers with Him. This is great. Okay, so here's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to do. I want you to pray. Pray with us. Pray with our church community. Pray with... Pray with us, those who want to receive this. And and let's believe God for an impartation. Impartation means God takes something that he's given to somebody else and he shares it with us, right? And you have an understanding of the power of the gospel. I want us to have that understanding of the power of the gospel, not just right now, but when we go to meet with Billy, the yes. Billy's in our life or the other yes. people in our life. And we're sitting across from them and we're wondering, God, what can you do? Or really what we're wondering is, God, what can I do? I don't have anything to say. And it's, God, what can you do? And with you 
nothing is impossible. Amen. Let's pray. Pray with us. If you want the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to be a witness, I want you to put your hands up real high. You. you know, it's interesting. Jesus told his disciples that they had to wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit so they could become witnesses. Yes. And from the the, 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 the birth of the church was not because the disciples were so good at preaching the gospel it's because they actually received the gift of the Holy Spirit that made them effective at witnessing about Christ and that same gift the Holy Spirit of God is available to you today so I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit would empower you to become a witness in your community to your family when I became a Christian and I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit came over my life I led my brothers to the Lord. I led my family members to the Lord. My cousins, people started coming to Christ, my best friends. That's how the gospel works. And it wasn't because I knew so much. I didn't even know one verse. I just said, man, Jesus saves. And I, don't, and they got, I don't even know how they got saved. They just got saved, you know, and they still saved. So they got real saved, you know. So Lord, I thank you, Father. I thank you for this beautiful church, these people that you have pulled together. And I pray right now that you would lay your Holy Spirit upon them that you would empower them to be your witnesses in this community. Whether they're in a, in a middle school, in a high school, in a college, in a company, in a hospital, whatever their vocation is, families, friends, God, that many would come to know Christ through them. Lord, I pray that you would lead them, that you would empower them to be witnesses. In Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us at the Grace Honolulu YouTube channel. If you'd like to receive more sermons or content, please subscribe. And if you'd like to give, you can give at gracehonolulu.org. Have an amazing day, and we'll see you next time. God bless.